Okay, thank you. I'm glad so many of you are still here and haven't given up on this conference yet. <laughs> but I can see why most of the content has been pretty good. So I'm here to talk about, as Stephen said, the elephant's trunk in Postgres 9.5. Uh, just before I even get started with introducing myself, who is already using Postgres 9.5 for anything real? Okay. <laughs> why am I not surprised that the two hands that go up are people who are actually committers on the project? I hope you guys are working on 9.5. You've probably got 9.6 running soon. Yeah. Okay, so. <clears throat> Sorry? Can we branch? You can branch in your own local repository. One of the powers of Git. Okay, so my name is Magnus Hagener. As uh, Steven said, I've been around Postgres for a long time. Uh, for a very long time, at this point, I'm part of the Postgres core team. Uh, I'm one of the committers, along with, for example, Stephen and uh, Joe, and maybe I saw someone else in the back. Uh, <clears throat> so I work on the actual code, uh, and feel free to heckle me for not committing enough things in this version, which I really haven't, <laughs> uh, and I should have done more work, but, you know, we, we leave, gotta leave it to somebody else in some of the times. Um, <clears throat> I also do a lot of work for Postgres Europe, uh, part of the team that organizes sort of the, the European version of this conference and, and things like that. Uh, when I don't work on community stuff, I work for a company called Red Pill Inpro that I bet most of you haven't heard of. Uh, we're a local open source services company featured in the Scandinavian region. I'm out of Stockholm in Sweden myself. Uh, we do sort of all things around open source products, Postgres being one of our focus products where we do you know, consulting, training, support, uh, custom development. I think we've done exactly once. Uh, on the back end, things like that. So let's go for another show of hands. How many of you read Planet Postgres on a regular basis? For the rest of you, I suggest you take a look at that. It's an excellent resource. Uh, we have a number of people who keep writing blogs, so they've been working on it for almost a year. Whenever someone commits a new larger feature, within a couple of days, somebody else usually picks it up tests it and writes a post about how to actually use it, and, you know, what it means for people who are not the developers. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so if you haven't already, go read that thing. I suggest sticking it in your RSS reader so that you get it on a regular basis. It has a lot of very good content. So Postgres 9.5 development started officially on June 10th last year, which is when we branched off uh, Postgres 9.4 and then rebranded the master branch of the Postgres repository as 9.5 develop. Uh, and in the Postgres project, we use a process that we call commit fests, where the theory is uh, that we take the development period and we split it into pieces where we do uh, one month worth of development, and then we do one month worth of what we call the commit fest, which is review of the patches that were written in the first month and then commit of them, hopefully. And then we sort of go back one month development, one month review. Uh, that's the general idea behind the process. <clears throat> because you know, we all do iterative development and we all have to have our own name for it. That's our name. So 9.5 is the first Postgres release to do five commit fest. Previously, we've done four. But we had one in June, one in August, one in October, one in December, and one in February. I'm getting to that. But that's the plan, and officially that's what we have. And if you go look, look into our databases, that's what we have, right? So that means that the current status is that we are in the final commit fest, and normally these commit fests are one month, right? But we do allow for the second, or the last commit fest to be two months. Uh, other than that, we would already be behind schedule. But in fact, in reality, we're in basically continuous commit fest since sometime around September because we've not been able to close out the commit fest in one month, so it's all been just flowing into continuous commit fest mode, which isn't very good, which is something we need to do something about. One thing that you guys can help with that is just reviewing and testing all the things that are in the commit fest. Now, because if we don't get the ones we have now, then they're gonna get punted and not be in 9.5, but also as we get started on the 9.6 cycle, in the early commit fest as well, a lot of the features that we have in this version came in you know, August last year. And it's not just the code review, right? So you don't actually have to be a C coder to help us with the commit fests. Simple thing of, you know, well, you need to be to the point that you know how to apply a patch and run make. But that's pretty much it. So if you can download a patch, see that it works, see that it compiles, and test the feature, 
Like run it and see what happens. If it adds a new SQL command, make sure that it works. And just report that. That is actually of very much help. Now we still need the people who do the review of the code itself. But in particular, if you can find something that doesn't work, then we can bounce it back and get it fixed before those guys even start spending time on it. If you do have C coding skills, we absolutely need more people to help us with the review at the C code level as well. So, because we really don't want to be stuck in this continuous commit fest you know, for another year. Uh, nobody is going to be happier from that. So the idea is we try to push this through, uh, try to push the commit fest through on the actual schedule so that we can then focus you know, on the parts that everybody likes, which is writing new stuff for another month. <clears throat> so that's the idea. We very much like to see you help with that. Uh, <clears throat> so some current statistics. Oh, and this is almost current, because as we are in the final commit fest, things happen every day now. So this is about a week's old statistics. Uh, the commit compared to 9.4, we had modified about 2,500 files, did uh, 222,000 new lines of code, and removed 135,000. Uh, this is almost double that that we had in 9.4. 9.4 was a, a we've, we've been on a, on a declining trend for a couple of versions, and now we're going back up to about the double, because we all know that lines of code is the best way to measure <laughs> developer productivity, right? <laughs> this is a very relevant number. Yeah, of course it isn't. It could be a single patch that just touches a lot of code. Or, you know, some of the most important patches we have. I, for example, when we implemented uh, synchronous replication in Postgres, I think we can all agree that's a pretty major patch. And it was tiny compared to the amount of features. It was a small patch. So, yeah, lines of code are awesome, but uh, let's not focus too much on that. <clears throat> but it shows that we're really, yeah, there is a lot of work being done. There is a lot of churn in the Postgres code base. There are a lot of things going on at all times. Uh, now, some of this is visible to you, some of it isn't visible to you. Uh, some of it is pure infrastructure, some of it is maybe infrastructure that you can build your own features on, uh, and some is just very, very obvious end user functionality. Uh, so I've tried to sort of split this into four areas. Uh, developer and SQL level features, for those of you who are working with the database from an application perspective. DBA and administration, for you who are stuck with running it. And of course, this is database, this is computers. We're always interested in performance. Every Postgres release has performance improvements, but I've tried to single out a couple of them. And then, of course, as we are in the final commit phase, there are things still in the queue that we can still hope for, uh, and that you can still help reviewing and making sure that you know, those hopes actually come true. <clears throat> so let me start. Some of these are coming in sort of a semi-chronological order, rather than anything else, like the features that came in first. But let me start with the developer and SQL features. Uh, one of those features that is actually, it seems like a fairly small one, but if you need it, it turns out to be really, really useful, is that you can now do a multi-column subselect update. So basically, previously, if you did an update, set a column equals the return value from a subselect, you could only do one column. If you wanted to update two columns, you had to run two updates, or write some really, really strange syntax with like expanding and unexpanding row constructs and stuff like that. Uh, this will just let you say, you know, update, set, list two columns, and a subselect of any kind that can return multiple columns. This is an SQL standard syntax. Uh, so it should work if you have like query generators or anything that can use this. It should be just a flag to use it. Uh, now, if I'm not mistaken, the uh, standard actually allows any row construct in this point, and we don't. We only allow a subselect, but it turns out that's what people actually want. Oh, you can do values. We've been able to do values before, but um, there are other kinds of weird row constructs that we can't actually do at that point. Uh, another one of those useful features where we had the features, but it was somewhat limited, uh, is the function generate series. So, who in here has used generate series? Okay, good. This is well, it's a, it's a crowd that knows Postgres, right? Generate series is one of those tiny functions that turns out to be fantastically useful. It just generates a list of some things. Prior to 9.5, it could generate a list of integers, and it could generate a list of timestamps, uh, basically. Now we can also do numeric, which means we can do decimal numbers, like in the example here. Select star from generate series. It's a set returning function. Uh, 0, 0,1, 0, 0,2, 0, 0,3, 0, 0,4, 0, 0,5, 0, 0,6, 0, 0,7, 0, 0,8, 0, 0,9, 0, 0,10, 0
comma 0.1 means start at zero, go to one in increments of 0.1, which we couldn't do before because 0.1 is not an integer. Uh, and it also means that we can now reach uh, larger numbers than we can get with an integer. I'm not sure you really want your generate series to be that big, uh, but you could start at a high number. <laughs> like a generate series that returns more than two billion rows might not be very fast, but if you start at two billion and go up, it would make sense. Uh, so we do have it available for numeric. Uh, and continuing on the range of sort of things that we had part of the way, um, who has ever used select for update no wait? Okay, a couple of you. So no wait has the, what do you mean? If you do a regular select star from something for update, if someone else is locking a row, we will block. We'll wait until they're done, and then we'll return value. If you say select star for update no wait, well, if someone else is locking the row, we'll say could not obtain lock, and then we'll abort your transaction, uh, which is helpful in some cases. But the, what the new code that says you know, select with skip locked instead of no wait, will skip the locked rows and return all the other rows in the table. So in this example, it returned two rows, two and three. My other session had a lock on the row with value one. Um, it's a fairly narrow use case where this is useful because you're intentionally not actually returning the complete result of your query. So you probably don't want to do this if you're doing like reporting, but it's <clears throat> very efficient when you're doing, for example, queue processing. You have a worker queue somewhere. You can combine this also with a limit. You know, take the first value out of the queue, but skip any value that somebody else is already working on. It's pretty convenient, and it, with this, it becomes much, much easier to do than it used to be. So simple worker queues can now be implemented without a lot of the external support that we previously needed. Uh, one of the more major features, I'd say, that are exposed at the sort of SQL level that I've actually been put in is uh, row level security. Uh, of course, this is when you should have had a time machine, and I'd say, you know, if you'd like to learn more about row level security, go back about four hours in time and go see the presentation just before lunch. I had hoped that, you know, I'd be scheduled earlier than the last session so that I could just deflect any details to whoever comes later, but uh, I guess I'll now just have to tell you my story and those of you who went to the row level security talk will correct me <clears throat> when I'm wrong. Right. No, <laughs> you're not allowed to do it. Uh, the idea behind row level security is to apply access policies on a per row basis. You can almost get that from the name. Uh, so previously we had table level permissions, right? You can grant access on a table, and we had column level permissions. You can grant you know, any level of access on the, le uh, on the point uh, of a column. Now, the idea here is we can limit the access to individual rows. This is something we could do before. You know, we could create manual views. Remember to make them security barrier views so that you know, people can't look through them. Uh, but using this feature, it becomes a lot easier. So what we do is we create basically a policy uh, for a table that says this user is allowed to see rows that look like this. Now, they still have the regular ACLs. So you still have the ability to also limit on a table level also limit on a column level. We just add one more thing. And you know, as should be with all permissions, you need all of them to actually see the data. It's not enough to have one of them. Uh, it's worth noticing that, as usual, super users and table owners will bypass the security. So don't give people super user, like ever. <laughs> Keep that to yourself and your evil plans. There's also a new uh, role attribute that you can give to a user, which is bypass RLS which says that this user, without being a super user or an owner, will be able to just read everything in your table or write everything in your table, regardless of what the row level security policies are. Uh, now, row level security is enabled on an individual table basis uh, with a simple alter table command. So the syntax looks sort of like this. Uh, I think I took partially the, the example from the uh, documentation where say alter table companies enable row level security. Okay, now it's enabled. Uh, once you've enabled it on a per table basis, you need to create a policy. These are also created on an individual table basis. So in this case, we say, so create the policy uh, companies manager on companies for all. That means for all operations. Uh, we can create individual policies for read and write. So you can say you're allowed to write the data, but then you're not allowed to see it. 
That can lead to really interesting application behaviors, by the way. That's not just a feature of row-level security. You can do that with, uh, with views. We, but applications tend to be confused. And then we say too public. So you can limit this policy on an individual role basis, saying this policy only applies to users that are part of a role. Then we say using. And finally, we give any expression, basically. And what's in here, if it uh, evaluates as true, the user is allowed to view the row. If it evaluates as false, the user is not allowed to view the row. So in this case, we're saying, you know, the user is allowed to view or update or, or edit any row which has where the column manager contains the same value as the variable current user, being the user that is logged in. Uh, <coughs> Which, of course, means that when we read it, this is just an example, and there, here is the difference. So I'm first logged in as user Postgres, doing select star from companies. I've just added three companies. I'm, myself, the manager of two of them, and test is the manager of the third. If I reconnect as the user test, I can only see that row, because that's the only row for which this expression evaluates is true. So it's a very simple level of filtering, but it's also worth noting it doesn't give you an error. Okay, if you don't have uh, table level permissions on a table, and you try to do a select from it, you get a permission denied. Row level security does not give you permission denied. It just takes away the data. So if you actually create a policy that is just false, every table will just look empty, but your queries will still work. And you know, your colleagues that you applied that policy to will be really annoyed. And you can do policies on any sort of regular expressions. There are a few things you can't do in your policies. You can't do aggregates. It's one of the big ones. So you can't do sort of where some value equals select count star from a table somewhere. But you can access other tables. So you can do subqueries and things like that uh, in order to evaluate uh, whether this expression is going to be true. And um, I've yet to write an expression complicated enough that it doesn't work. Uh, other than I've written them complicated enough that I wrote them wrong, but that's not Postgres' fault. Uh, <clears throat> but it's the general expression manager. You can define multiple policies on a single table. Works just fine. In this case, the results are ORed. So you need to have access through any one of the policies to gain access to the table. It's also worth noticing it does not affect cascading RI operations. So if you have a foreign key with a cascading operation, that bypasses RLS. Unless you, I mean, if you have RLS on both sides, then you won't be able to delete the row in the first place, for example. It will still be there, but if it's the foreign key that deletes the row, it will be deleted. That obviously only applies to writes and not reads. But yeah, you can do policies that are really complicated. I, just, I had to test it just to make sure it worked, so otherwise I would have bitched on, uh, at Steven. But you can, for example, put a recursive query into the expression. In this case, I, I changed my managers to be a hierarchy and just traversing the whole hierarchy as I evaluate the different rows. Um, you know, it just works because it's a Postgres expression. Now, if your table gets big and if your manager's table gets big, there are no guarantees that this will be fast, right? But it will work. And, you know, make it slow enough. That's another security policy. Like anyone who tries to read the data is not supposed to, just doesn't have the patience. Not sure that would like pass any audit or anything, but you know. But the general idea, anything we put in this using, sort of anything Postgres can do, except aggregates, will work in there. Normally, as with all these things, like keep your policies reasonably simple. Otherwise, you're gonna do like I did when I tested this. And I, I was actually initially convinced that this did not work, but that turned out to be entirely my own fault for having another policy on the table. And I missed the fact that they ordered them together. So um, it's easy to get lost when you do these things. So with all things security, you know, a reasonable level of simplicity is usually a good idea. Uh, so moving on out of the sort of SQL layer a little bit, uh, more into the DBA and administration side. Uh, so who in here is running more than one instance of Postgres on the same server? Quite a few of you. You're going to like this one, right? A very simple thing. We have a new configuration parameter uh, called cluster name. If you set it, we will just print it in the process title. So in this case, I've named my cluster my test cluster, and now every process associated with this cluster has my test cluster in the process title. 
if I don't set it, we just leave, leave it out completely. Uh, it's convenient if you have multiple instances and you want to figure out who really is this. Sure, we have all the process trees and you can go back and look at command lines to try to figure out where the data directory is. Now you can just do grep directly on, uh, on your PS outputs. Uh, so it's a very convenient feature in those cases. It's a very convenient feature for those of us who develop Postgres and have like 20 different instances running at the same time, who has never killed the wrong one. Uh, another thing on the DBA side, so uh, we've a bunch of enhancements on our foreign tables. One of them is you can now say import foreign schema. Uh, obviously it requires support in your FDW, but the one that's for Postgres comes with the support. Uh, so basically uh, the command here is uh, you, you need to create the local schema first, then you say import foreign schema something from server the server that is defined as a server, and then into the local schema. And then the FDW will just reach out to the Postgres server on the other side, will copy every individual table definition, and create those as foreign tables. Uh, if we list them then, so in, remote, in the local schema named remote schema, we'll just get them there. Uh, and it will not, obviously, not just copy over the table name, but actually the column definitions. If you have a lot of tables, that'll save you a lot of time. Questions in the back? It's a one-time thing. It does not update. Yes. Sorry? Uh, I don't believe we have refreshability of this. It's not a bad idea to have it. Uh, and I, actually, as you say, what I don't really know is if I run the same command again, does it error because the tables are already there, or does it skip them? I've, does anyone know? Okay, Steven thinks it will error. I think it will error, but it would be kind of neat if it didn't. But I'll have to test that. So yeah, there is no, but there is no refresh. It will definitely not update a table that has changed its structure or anything like that. But you can just drop the local foreign table because it has no data, and then do an import again. Yes? Oh, you try to read the data and see what comes back. <laughs> or, or you can use the backslash D plus. Do you need the plus? Okay, it shows up directly in backslash D in PSQL. And presumably there will eventually be a PG admin release that will also be able to view them. Uh, I don't think it's there, but. Yeah, so you can see that the policy is there. You can't see the rows that it's potentially hiding. Yeah, but no, the, the schema in Postgres is basically you can read in PG catalog. Um, same thing, I mean, we hear that sometimes that people don't like, you, know, you can view the source code of stored procedures. It's the same thing. Uh, so there's no uh, prevention of that. Another thing that went in very recently uh, in relation to foreign tables is that foreign tables can now participate in an inheritance tree. It means you can create tables with inheritance that includes foreign tables uh, in the tree. Now foreign tables today, uh, sorry, inheritance today in Postgres is used for partitioning. Now there are drawbacks to this way of doing partitioning, but you know, it's how we do it. And the advantage of this is you'll, this means you'll be able to have like a partition that is on a different machine, or what some people would call sharding. Uh, and it uses constraint exclusion the same way that you know, constraint exclusion works for local tables. So you have a check constraint that'll tell you like rows matching this goes over there. Uh, that may well be added in line four. It's the inheritance, it, or it was added very early on. They're not very useful without uh, actually having the inheritance. Uh, so the inheritance allows you to basically take a partition and put it somewhere else. Uh, now there's obviously more work to be done when it comes to optimizing queries and things using this, but basic sharding using that is certainly doable. Uh, you can still, there are things like PG shard, an extension uh, from Citus data that will actually do sharding in with a bit more advanced functionality, but this gets you pretty far and it gives you the same interface as local partitions, which has a lot of other advantages. And of course, I mean, it will be improved on. 
Um, for those of you who use unlog tables, you've probably been annoyed that you've been unable to change it, so now you're able to change it, right? You can now change a table to go from unlogged to logged, or from logged to unlogged. Um, with a simple alter table set unlogged and alter table set logged, obviously. Uh, well, I, I don't think it's a small caveat about indexes. There's a small bug yeah, yeah. related to indexes, but we're hoping, we're, we're assuming, I'd say, that that's gonna get fixed. But, but some interesting things can happen with indexes right now if you're using the unreleased version. Um, it will have to log the contents of the table, yes. So if it's a terabyte table, the operation to set it to logged will log a terabyte of data. Because it's the only way to do it, right? Because for example, in the replication scenario, suddenly it need to appear on the slave, so we need to log the data. Uh, whereas of course, if you go from logged to unlogged, that's just a simple metadata operation saying, anything in the log that has to do with this table, you can just ignore that now. Uh, <coughs> So again, if you're using the feature, it's been really annoying, you couldn't do this. This is a nice improvement. Yes? I was saying it does truncate it on the slave. It does truncate it, but it's like all unlogged tables, it's present on the slave, but it's empty. Yeah, so that once you fail over, for example, the table is there, it's just empty. Um, is anyone using alter system set that we released in the last version? Yes. Wow, no one is using that. Yes. <laughs> I think you can guess that Steven didn't like that feature. <laughs> uh, it could be because you're not running 9.4 yet, right? In that case, you can skip. Sorry, sorry? That's actually a good question. Who is actually running 9.4? Okay, that's way more people than we're using alter system set. <laughs> but if you are using, or if you will be using, or if your colleagues are using alter system set, you can now also do alter system reset to change your mind. Uh, basically what it does, it resets the config variable back to, variable back to whatever is in postgres.conf. Or if there is nothing in postgres.conf, it goes all the way back to the default value. Uh, the implementation basically means it gets deleted from the postgres.auto.conf file. Uh, which is where we put it when you said alter system set. Uh, and as with alter system set, yes, you still need to do a select PG reload conf, or you know, do a service Postgres reload, or whatever it is on your platform. Otherwise it will be reset, but it doesn't actually take effect. Or, or if you do this with like shared buffers or, or some nice feature like that, you have to restart the whole thing. And you can't do that from inside of SQL. Uh, I'm not sure how that would work, but so you can't. But yeah, since nobody was using that, let's just uh, skip ahead to the next one instead. Uh, there's a bunch of, of interesting sort of more infrastructure level functionality, one of them being we now track commit timestamps, if you want to. It's a parameter in postgres.conf. You can say track commit timestamp to on, in which case we start tracking commit timestamps. Well, that means that every time we write a commit record to the transaction log, we also tell it what time it is. So there is an obvious small amounts of overhead, because we have to actually figure out what time it is, uh, which can be surprisingly expensive. But then one thing you can do is you get a function called pgxact commit timestamp that you give an XID. Uh, and if you know how Postgres MVCC work, if you look at the xmin, it's sort of that's the earliest XID that can see the version of this row. So that would be the one that wrote it. Uh, so you can say select pgxact commit xmin from a table it'll tell you that, well, this row, this table clearly only has one row, which was committed by transaction 787, which was committed at exactly this time. So you can figure out when a row was changed. Uh, you can also use the function pg last committed exact, which will just tell you when did a transaction last commit on this system. And well, uh, this is a set returning function that returns both okay, this was the last transaction ID that was committed, and this is when it was committed. Uh, I'm sure we'll see more sort of other things built on top of this as well, 
Uh, there are other use cases for it rather than just looking at your rows. Yes. Transaction number rolled over. Is it negative infinity or what? Uh, no, the XID still has a value, right? And the, and the timestamp is a separate field. The timestamp isn't calculated incrementally. It's just the timestamp. Yeah, that will, that will affect the XID field, okay. obviously, but it won't affect the timestamp. Oh, okay. You, you could be saying that if you want to worry about all the time, you could just, yeah, yeah. The, 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 let's say we look on that, okay, yeah. But yes. you won't ever get deep inside of one run of this function, or something is very wrong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Can you only call this timestamp as far back as you have all of the loops, or are there? Uh, no, you can go uh, exactly how far back can you go? There is a separate set of data that stores how much it is. Uh, it's a good question, exactly how it goes back to I think the the last global vacuum freeze. I think it's the is it all data cycle? Is that like the oldest currently running? Or no? no, it's way past the oldest currently running oh, transaction. Okay. I think it's back to the oldest vacuum freeze. Uh, it's, it's not related to WAL. It's not related to how much WAL you have. We don't actually look in the WAL to get it. We, uh, we write it to the WAL, obviously, as we commit it, but we also write it to a separate set of metadata uh, information. There is a, there is a commit TS directory uh, that has a, a file with it. So obviously, it does also, you, if you're tracking this, yeah, this is data that you're storing. Your data directory is going to be bigger. Yeah, the, the amount of data would be the same as in the C log. That seems to make sense. Back. It goes, yeah, the same amount back in time yeah. as the C log does. If you're using the vacuum DB command, you know, when you've really screwed up your database and you need to vacuum everything at once, hopefully you never have to do that. Uh, but if you do, you often need it to happen quickly. Uh, it seems surprisingly simple. It took many, many, many rounds of new versions of this patch before it got in. Uh, but we have the ability to just add a dash J to the command line vacuum DB command. That'll just run multiple vacuums in parallel. So if you say, you know, dash J20, it'll run 20 back vacuums in parallel and most likely kill your IO system. <laughs> right, and everything else stops. But, you know, if you need to run vacuum really fast because your system is, like, completely screwed up, then basically you want to run as fast as your I.O. system can do. But it will block other operations that are happening in your database. It won't block them lockwise necessarily, depending on, on how you're running it. But it'll, if it uses up all your I.O. capacity, then there's nothing left for everybody else. So be careful of the load there. Uh, if, yes? I don't believe it tries to be smart about table spaces. It tries to be reasonably smart about table sizes, uh, but not table spaces. Uh, an important change that's probably going to affect every single one of you is that the good old parameter checkpoint segments doesn't exist anymore. It has been removed. <laughs> we no longer have this awkward way of specifying sizes. Instead, we have two parameters, min while size and max while size. It just, well, it tells you the minimum and maximum size of your PGX log directory. So you get rid of this calculation of, well, it's three times the value times 16 megabytes, which is how much disk space you need. You just say maximum while size equals how big can it be. Uh, and Postgres will then automatically tune when it's going to do its checkpoints to stay between this, um, between these limits. Uh, and it uses a moving average of previous checkpoints to figure out when to start the next one. Obviously, we still use checkpoint timeout. If you want to run a checkpoint every five minutes or every 15 minutes or, or how you configured it, this just controls the space level. But it's a lot more reasonable to configure it this way. And we've also moved the default sort of out of the 80s. Uh, so the default is no longer uh, 3 times 16 megabytes. The default is now minimum size 80 megabytes and maximum size 1 gigabyte, which is really, don't you have a gigabyte free space? You probably do. I don't think that's a problem. But if you re are really space constrained, you'll need to bring max file size down again. If you set these two to exactly the same value, you get the same behavior as you had before. Because that basically turns off the auto-tuning. Right? So if you set them both to 48 megabytes, you get the default from before. 
but you don't want that. Uh, what it also means is we only actually consume the space when we really need it. Like previously, we could fill out stuff even if we didn't need it, the way that max checkpoint, uh, that checkpoint segments work. Now it's going to recycle them as needed and just keep the space down when possible uh, by using this moving average of, of what it's needed before. Another thing that will affect a number of you at least uh, is that we've gotten rid of pause at recovery target when you're doing point in time recovery. Instead, we have a parameter called recovery target action that can be pause, or it can be promote, or it can be shut down. Uh, Pause still requires you to have enabled hot standby, and I think we're still discussing what's gonna happen if you put an incompatible value in there, but uh, these are the values. So instead of adding another parameter, we added the new one and took the old one away. Uh, but this controls what's gonna happen when your point in time restore reaches the end. Do you want it to open up in read-only mode? Do you wanna actually open it up for full usage, or you, do you just wanna shut the system down? Because you might be preparing it for something else and not wanna open it at all. Is that a question or? Okay, you were just yawning. Okay, that's good. You had your hand very high up. Uh, some other things that we were hoping would probably lead us to a little bit more, but the SSL code in Postgres has finally been completely refactored. Uh, the idea being that we can support other implementations than OpenSSL, uh, which we could, but we haven't actually written the code for that yet. So we still only support OpenSSL but we have infrastructure there to make it possible to support other SSL implementations reasonably soon. We've also added support for subject alternate names in your certificates. If your server has multiple different names, we won't error out in uh, uh, SSL mode equals verify full, as long as the name is in alternate names. Uh, it's mostly something to build on, uh, the, the refactoring. Uh, who in here is using PGX log dump? Very few of you, well, good for you, because it's really a, once you have to use PGX log dump, you're already in trouble, right? But there is a new interesting thing about PGX log dump, which takes the stats argument now, that it can look through your log files and figure out what kind of data is in the log file. What's using up the space in your X log? Is it index updates? Is it full page writes? Is it heap updates? Uh, so you can run that basically on your log file. You can use that to figure out why is my replication taking so much bandwidth? So it's now become useful for other things than just, uh-oh, my database is in real trouble. <laughs> uh, you can still do that, of course. But the stats thing actually can be used for a lot of other things to gain insight into what's happening in your system. And it just takes, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it takes the xlog directory, the first segment file and the last segment file, and it'll just summarize everything that happened between these two points in time and, and give you a nice little output that tells you uh, what kind of data is in your log file. Uh, so that'll help you figure out you know, why things are running slow because you're generating too much log. Um, so moving quickly into a more performance-related area. Uh, some of you may have been to Simon's talk. If you're not, well, now you only need to go back like two hours in your little time machine to look at brain indexes, which is uh, what we call a block range index. It's a new index type. Um, it is what we formerly called minmax. It supports other op classes. I don't think we have any other op classes implemented but you know, it could be. The idea with this one is instead of your regular index, which stores every value in, a B tree index will store every value in a sorted way in a B tree. This one only stores bounds per block range. So the default is to take 128 blocks in your data file and it stores what's the highest and the lowest value that's present in this block. That's min max when we say highest and lowest. But we can do other op classes, so it would be interesting to see things like applying this to geographical operations, saying, you know, things that are in this area lives over on this blocks. Now, it's somewhat limited in what it can do, but what it'll do is it'll then figure out sort of which blocks and then do a sequential scan within these 128 blocks, for example. So it, to be efficient, it requires a table that has some sort of natural order on disk. Uh, the typical, the simplest use case is, well, you have a log table somewhere, you have an continuously incrementing timestamp or ID column. Brin indexes are ideal for that because you won't do that. If you have a heavily updated table, Brin indexes will probably be mostly useless because you know, your data is randomly distributed throughout the table. The main win of Brin is they're small 
and it's very cheap to do inserts into a table with a Brin index. Like the overhead of inserts is much, much, much lower than it is on a B tree index. It's just a regular Postgres index type, so you just say create index using Brin, and then you, get, you always get a bitmap index scan on it. And you can change the parameter pages per range, which tells you sort of what size index do you want in relation to your size of data. Um, we can't really give any recommendations on that yet. Uh, we need to run much more you know, real world tests to tell you what the good numbers are there. So you know, please run those tests and let us know. Uh, for those of you who've run into the problem of the gin pending list in Postgres, you can finally tune it. Uh, it used to be uh, tuned by workmem, which is really, really bad, because <laughs> it's completely unrelated. Uh, so the gin pen pending list is used for the gin fast update. Uh, fast update means that when you do an in insert or update in gin, we just post that on a separate list onto the side, because it's very expensive to update an index. And then we hope a vacuum will come around and put it back in the main table. But if this list gets full, then we're gonna put it back in the main table while you're waiting. And you don't want that. So this gives you the ability to tune that. You can set the parameter as a uh, uh, config parameter or individually on each index. So if you might need a bigger list or you might need a smaller list, if you need it smaller, yeah, you're gonna get more of the cleanups happening while you're waiting, but they're gonna go faster. So it's a use case dependent, but it, it takes care of a lot of problems. And Workmem has nothing to do with it, so. Uh, we also have GIST index only scan, which showed up just a couple of days ago. Uh, currently, it's only supported for box and point, but I see some PostGIS people in the room. Hello. We want this for PostGIS, right? It needs opclass support. There are more opclasses working both internally and externally. I'm not actually sure if it's even gonna be possible to do it in PostGIS, but you know, index only scans are a good thing if we can make them work. This has the infrastructure, and as we say, box and point. Uh, we have support for compression in, of the transaction log. Now we will only compress the full page images, but if you have full page images enabled, they're usually a fairly large portion of the size of your transaction log. And basically it's about you trade CPU for IO, right? You pay the CPU cost, you get a lower IO cost. And you also get you know, less replication traffic if that's the part that affects you. But it is still worthwhile to uh, gzip your archive files, because all the data that is not a full page image will still be written uh, uncompressed to the file. Uh, we do also have like a new WAL format, which you probably don't care about unless you're actually writing a WAL parser. Uh, and we've changed the CRC algorithm, which really doesn't affect you at all. Hopefully it'll be faster. <laughs> and we'll have the ability to make more hardware optimized versions of it based on that. Uh, there's been a number of rounds of things to enhance sorting performance of different kinds. Uh, we have abbreviated keys for text sorting. There's a patch in the queue for numeric, uh, and there might be something else coming online as well, and it's obviously something we can keep working on in the future as well, uh, which can speed up sorting a lot. Uh, we have a pre-check for equality for text sorting. Again, because actually doing a mem compare is really fast. Doing a string compare is surprisingly slow because of locales and you know, everybody not being US ASCII 7. Maybe here you are, but you know, the rest of us. And there's been a bunch of other things done around this as well. This is all transparent to you. The only thing you'll notice is that things go faster. That's like the best kind of enhancements. Yeah, I think I mentioned numeric, right? If I didn't, then yeah, numeric is in the queue and probably gonna get in there. Uh, there's been a whole bunch of changes to the low level locking APIs of Postgres. There's probably four or five people in here who actually ever looked at that. Uh, but we have a new at internal atomic API. We have better scalable lightweight locks that are built on top of this. Uh, there are a number of internal operations that are now lockless that used to require locks. We have concurrent locking for um, the hash table that accesses shared buffers. But in general, what this really means is, well, a lot of things will go faster in high concurrency environments. If you're just a single user, it doesn't really matter that much. But in high concurrency environments, it's gonna give you a, a speed up for free, right? There's also a bunch of things that are still in the queue. Uh, because we're in the final CF, last I checked, there were still more than 70 patches in the queue. So again, please help. We're only supposed to, we're supposed to clear this out in three weeks, right? 
That's not going to happen, but with your help, we might have a chance to get closer, right? There are some are big, some are small. So let me just mention a few. The first one is actually incorrect, and that's Andrew's fault. Uh, we're hoping for having min, max, mean, and standard deviation into PG stat statements. Turns out, as of about an hour ago, we have them, but I didn't bother updating the slides. <laughs> I, instead, I spent the time sending an email to Andrew. Uh, we also have a view called pgstat SSL, which is going to show you a lot of information about SSL-based connection, if I ever get around to actually reacting to reviewer comments, which I got like three months ago, and I still haven't updated it, so that's entirely my fault. We hope to get it there. Uh, so would you can tell that I did this before I left Sweden? We have a tool called PG Rewind, which has also been committed. It was committed on Tuesday. So people are working while we are conferencing, uh, which lets you rewind a replica or, or an old master to repoint a replica after a failover in asynchronous replication. We're hoping to have file level incremental backup. I wouldn't put too much hope into that actually getting into 9.5 at this point, but hopefully then 9.6. But maybe we'll get it into 9.5. We don't know yet. Uh, some of you may have gone to Robert Haas's talk. Otherwise, again, go back about five hours and you can learn more about parallel sequential scan, uh, which is a tiny, tiny part of the parallelization puzzle, but basically it allows us to run a sequential scan on multiple CPUs at the same time. Um, but what's really important about that, it's a whole lot of infrastructure underneath it that has been written and that we'll be able, we'll be able to use that for other operations that are much more interesting to parallelize, like doing aggregates or doing create index or eventually doing joins and things like that in parallel. But you know, it's a first step of a, of a long list of things that need to be done they're not going to be done for 9.5. They're not going to be done for 9.6 or 9.7 either, but hopefully maybe we can chip away one in every release or something like that. Uh, we have the insert on conflict patch, which has been around for a long time. Uh, hopefully we can get it done this time. Uh, it's basically what most of you would refer to as upsert. Right? Uh, the syntax, I think, that we're looking at right now is insert into a table somewhere, and then we say on conflict, either update or ignore. It seems like it should be a simple problem. Trust me, it's not. It's a very complicated problem when you start looking at concurrency. When you start looking at multiple sessions accessing the same rows, it becomes really, really hard. Part of it being just deciding how you want it to work. And then you have to actually make it work that way. And then you have to find about a zillion corner cases. Uh, so it's been, uh, a lot of time has been spent on it. Hopefully we can get it in. Uh, another big patch that I'm hoping for is grouping sets. Uh, the patch is there, it sort of works. There are some arguments about exactly how it should look, but it, I think it stands a good chance uh, with it. And, and that one along with absurd are the two big ones that we're really waiting on, I think. So grouping sets, for those who don't know, is where you can do, uh, the thing that most people use and most people are aware of is cube and roll up. Uh, but this is the generalized version that follows the SQL standard. But cube and roll up, it's basically if you say, uh, select a comma b comma count star group by roll up a comma b. If you just say group by a comma b, you get you know for every combination of a and b you get the count. For with roll up you also get for a the total sum for a, where b will then be set to null, and the total sum in that. And since the b is on there, you also get a null null and the value. So it lets you compute the sums as well as the groups. Uh, in the same one. And of course, using the generalized version, you can do a lot of really funky things. I've never used that myself, but I've used a lot of Cuban rollup on other databases. It's really convenient for uh, reporting queries and, and aggregating data. There's obviously always a lot more things. It's a bunch of other performance improvements. I can't mention them all. I know there are a couple of contributors in here. I am sorry if I missed your feature, um, but you know, I'm already running out of time. Uh, so I'm just going to mention one more feature, which is, I like to always bring out those, it's a really tiny feature, but it fixes a really big annoyance. If you use PSQL and point it at a custom format PG dump, we won't tell you this anymore. Instead, we'll actually tell you this is a custom format dump, use PG restore, you're using the wrong command. Like, it's really simple, but it's actually very nice to have that. We need to not just build these super advanced features, we need to actually you know, build these user-friendly features as well. So with that, I say thank you for showing up, and again, please, if you have any time, any chance at all, go to the CommitFest app, it's commitfest.postgres.org, pick a patch, take a look at it, build it, see if it works, 
let us know how it works for you. Just send in a report. Even if the report is just, hey, I ran it, and you know, it actually does what the contributor claims it does, well, you know, that's good to know. So help us verify that. And other than that, once we get to beta version, just download it and you know, pound it with your application and your code and get us the feedback as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think I'm out of time for questions, but feel free to approach me after with any questions that you have. <laughs>